Hey guys, how's it going? Welcome to Farmer Bounds Paradise. We are starting our new gardening series for 2021. And this year, what I decided to do is to go by date in my zone, showing you which seeds I start, what varieties and why, and answer a few questions. So first up is the herb, forest. to grow the herb borage in your vegetable garden with its beautiful cornflower colored star shaped flowers if that's not enough of an appeal it also has many many benefits to the garden borage also has several common names but i like to call it borage because the common names can kind of cross over into other flowers or herbs that also have the same common name. Starflower, for example. Sometimes people call uh, Confederate Jasmine starflower. Uh, Bee's friend is a very common, common name for forage, but so is um, another flower. Here, I'll show it to you. Facilia californica, also called Bee's friend. And it's also called bee flower and boo gloss, but we're gonna call it borage. Now, what are some of the benefits of borage? Well, obviously, if you haven't guessed already, it draws in pollinators, especially bees. In fact, if you are a beekeeper, you probably already know this, you definitely need to be growing borage because the nectar inside the flowers of this plant are said to increase the honey production. Take a quick look at this picture uh, that I took last year with this huge fat bee right in the center of the flower. Now, in addition to just drawing pollinators, which that in itself would be a good reason to have it in your vegetable garden, it also is said to repel the tomato hornworm and the cabbage worm. Now, I will swear to the fact that it does deter the tomato hornworm. Why do I say I can swear? Because every, ever since I have planted borage next to my tomato plants, I have never had a tomato hornworm. Now, if you wanna call that coincidence, maybe so, but I think we're on about the fourth or fifth year of me planting borage next to my tomatoes. Prior to that, I always had the to dreaded tomato hornworm. Last year, I think it was last year, I did a series on companion planting. And if you go to farmerbrownsparadise.com, you can see um, the videos and also all of the information I have there. All you have to do is print it up to keep in your garden folder. And here are some things that I said about borage. It is an annual, but it is a self-sower. So if you leave the flower heads on and they fall, it will sow a lot more borage right around that area. And if you don't want that to happen, make sure that you deadhead your borage plants. It's great to put in a compost pile, but again, if you don't want borage plants growing up everywhere, make sure you don't throw the flowers the, um, with the seeds on top of your compost pile. Borage um, has a taproot. It's not a real long taproot, fatter more than it is uh, long, but because it has a taproot, everything you read is probably going to tell you to sew it in place. And you can do that, but for me, the reason I go ahead and seed start it carefully is because I want it to be almost flowering just as soon as I'm putting out my tomatoes because my tomatoes are going to be the first plants, vegetables, that I will transplant out in my garden. So as we go through this video, I will show you exactly um, how I'm going to seed start it and why I'm using the containers that I will be using. Some other things about borage. 
Uh, it's said to improve the flavor and the growth of plants if you're interplanting it um, in the garden with them. Now this wouldn't be the case for me because we grow in containers and borage is too large of a plant to plant with something else like tomatoes in the same container. But if you are doing raised bed or just regular in-ground planting, it's a very good idea to put borage near tomatoes, strawberries, squash, um, and cabbage. Now for me, my cabbage is still growing out there right now. This is January 29th and our fall crop is still in full growth right now out in our garden. And because of that, it's going to be a while before um, I'll be pulling out those plants and getting the new potting mix ready. We've got to go do all new potting mix this year because this is our third season with the mix that's out there. So I want to have all my plants ready to go as soon as it's time to transplant them. Now we live in East Central Alabama Zone 8A and our average last frost date is April 10th. Now, I want to say something about that. We typically always have a cold snap or a freeze after Easter and I know people say that's a wives tale and old people will tell you that. Every year you'll hear that but I'm telling you it's true. We have a cold snap or get down to freezing temps at least one more time after Easter. This year, Easter is April 4th, which is a little earlier than usual. Usually it's around the second week of April, but we'll see. You know, last year, <laughs> Easter was, I think, in late April, and we actually were planting, I checked back in my calendar, March 28th. We had such a mild, mild winter that we were able to plant quite early. So with that in mind, I want to go ahead and have all my plants ready to go, including my companion plants. Borage is going to take about anywhere from a week to two weeks to germinate. And then uh, it takes a full eight weeks, couple of months for it to get to a mature stage. Now, borage will get at least two feet tall. Um, it doesn't like to be crowded, so I only put one borage plant per container. Five gallon bucket is what I'm using. Again, if you're planting in ground or raised bed, you can plant them about a foot apart. They, uh, when they grow, it's a kind of a tall stem and it has several branches. The stem itself can get pretty fragile, so um, I'm going to stake mine because it only has the single stalk. But if you've got them in ground or whatever, where you can plant them a little closer together, that helps to hold them up. Some other things about borage, I've already said that it attracts the beneficial insects, bees, and uh, parasitic wasps. Did you know that you can actually ferment the leaves of the borage plant, which I mentioned also last year in my article. You can take the leaves off, put them down in a bucket and cover the leaves, just barely covering it with water, put the lid on and let it kind of steep for about two weeks. Then you can take the solids out and save this fermented liquid, so to speak. You mix it with anywhere from one to 10 parts of water and you can use that as a fertilizer and you can fertilize once a week. The actual fermented mixture will stay good for months. Now, why is this such a good fertilizer? Well, it's because of what borage contains. It has a lot of vitamin C. It also contains potassium and calcium, all things that will benefit plant growth. Borage is also used in, as a medicinal herb. You might have even seen in the store uh, borage oil supplements. Um, 
it's supposed to improve your skin. You can use it to make soaps or essential oils, something like that. I've not ever done that, but um, there's a lot of information out there that talks about using it in that way. The borage plant is edible. I'd be careful though about consuming too much of it. Um, basically, all parts are consumable, but the leaves are really hairy and prickly. So I don't want to eat that. But the flowers themselves, the actual little petals, they are good to eat. You can put them in salads. It makes it decorative and it tastes a little bit like a cucumber. So this year, in addition to planting my borage in between my tomato plants, I'm also going to put them um, on the ground in some grow bags throughout the garden because I have totally seen how this plant just really draws the bees. They stay on that plant all the time. Your borage seeds are going to last around five years. They can last longer than that if you have optimum storing conditions. And this is the way I store my seeds. This is summer crops. I got this at Michael's. And actually, it was a few people on my Facebook group page that um, showed this. And I thought, oh, that is so cool. Because normally, I just was using Ziploc bags inside a bigger Ziploc bag in our extra refrigerator. But then it has these little individual containers here for each of your seeds. I just love it. So we'll get started real quickly. I'm gonna soak my seeds, talk about how I do that. We'll mix up some potting mix and then we'll go from there. I've shown this before in um, a seed starting video, but I like to soak my seeds in a solution of uh, water and hydrogen peroxide. So I've got one cup of warm water here and adding whoop, <laughs> one tablespoon of hydrogen peroxide to that. Then to soak my seeds, looks like I made a mess here. Then to soak my seeds, I just pour it in this little container here, add my seeds. I'm going to be planting eight containers but even though this is fairly new seed I'm still going to put more in there than that. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, Well, show you the seed up close. It's a black seed and it's hard coated. So that's another reason to soak it. Sometimes I actually nick it with um, or use it with a nail file, but this is so small that I'm not going to. Now I'm going to put the lid on and I'm going to let these soak for about two hours and then I'll show you what's next. So in the meantime, let's mix up some potty mix. If you've read my blog article on seed starting or watched the videos that are within that article, you will know completely why I soak my seeds in water hydrogen peroxide mix. You'll understand why I use potting mix and not a sterile seed starting mix when I start seeds. And you'll see the mix recipe there along with a video on how to make the best potting mix. Now here I am just making up a half a batch it consists of peat moss and some mushroom compost, um, perlite, 
Epsom salt, and also some lime. Now when I mix up the potting mix for our buckets, I do have some extra amendments that I talk about that I add. Um, if you're brand new to this system, we always recommend that you just use the straight potting mix and not add any additives until you've experienced a season. Now normally we mix up in our concrete mixer, but this is just a little half a batch. It'll be handy for me to have it in the wheelbarrow, so we're just mixing by hand. For your help, I will put a link to my blog article on seed starting in the description box below. Okay, well I actually soaked these seeds for 24 hours. It is the next day. And I did that for two reasons. One, I had one seed that was a floater. And usually when that happens, the way I describe it is dead things float. You know that you're not gonna get 100% germination in a pack of seeds. And especially if you're not buying from a really reputable company, um, the germination rate can be even less than that. These seeds, however, are new seed and I bought them from Baker Creek rareseeds.com last year um, so I'm pretty confident that the German germination rate will be really good but I had that floater and I thought okay well I'm just gonna let it do its thing soak a little bit longer uh, with hard coated seeds like that it's fine to leave them overnight in your soaking solution I do that with nasturtiums all the time and I also nick the nasturtium seed it's a pretty large seed and it's pretty easy to handle so uh, that's why I nick those I'm trying to think oh the other reason I waited overnight is because I just got busy doing other things it happens so let's talk a minute if you have read my seed starting guide you're probably wondering right now now wait a minute she germinates, she pre-germinates her seeds in paper towels. Yes, I do, for most seeds. I don't do that with really tiny, tiny seeds. In fact, I don't even soak really tiny, tiny seeds. Uh, things like lettuce, uh, onion seeds. <laughs> that is way too much trouble. But larger seeds, I do pre-soak them. And I normally pre-germinate them using the paper towel method. If you go to my website, again, it's in the description box below, I give you a total uh, outline of everything I do to start seeds, and there are some videos Im embedded in there too, as I said before. Also on that blog post in that article, I give you a chart and describe three different kinds of seeds easy seeds, fussy seeds, and don't mess with me, direct sow seeds. Okay, what that means, the easy seeds do not mind having their roots disturbed. And you're not gonna kill it if you manipulate the roots a little bit. Things like tomatoes and peppers and eggplants. Actually, there's a whole long list. The majority of the vegetable seeds are easy seeds, which is great. With easy seeds, I plant them in three inch net cups. The reason I do that is because I'll put two or three seeds in there and then when they sprout, I can separate them out um, into individual three inch net cups. And as they grow, if they outgrow that little tiny container, I can move it up to something larger if it's not time yet to transplant it out into the garden. Fussy seeds are different though. Fussy seeds are things like squash, melons, well, and in this case, borage. Most people would classify borage though as a don't mess with me direct sow, as I explained before, because it has that tap root. But they also say things like corn is a direct sow. Well, if you grow in containers, you really do need to seed start your corn. And there's a lot of reasons why 
But if you're interested in that, I had a whole series I did a year or two ago on corn. And it goes over that whole thing. The point being that just because it says direct sow does not mean that you can't seed start it. It means it's very fussy and you need to think about that when you're seed starting. So for fussy seeds, I use larger net cups. This is a net cup. It has holes on the sides and the bottom. Naturally air prunes. Talk a lot about that in a lot of my videos. This is a large one. It's a, it's about a five inch net cup. And I've got 12 here in this wonderful tray. I have several of these trays. Um, this is the tallest one, but I also have some that are about mm, that shallow and bigger square around that are great to use for seed starting uh, with any size cup, but especially the three inches because it holds so many. Because I will be bottom watering after these start sprouting. I won't be top watering, bottom watering. Okay. In my blog article and in the video that I did with it, I was using three inch net cups. I filled it with moistened potting mix, the potting mix recipe that I just showed you, or I just did. If you wanna see the potting mix recipe in that video, um, there's also a blog article down in the description box that I will link to that. This is dampened. My whole mix, I dampened it with some warm water. Um, dampened to the point of when you open a regular bag of <clears throat> potting mix that's pre-mixed stuff, you know that dampness, that's what it's moistened to that level. Before I'm going to plant these seeds, I'm not pre-germinating them, I'm just gonna plant them straight. Um, I'm gonna need to put some water, more water in these cups. I'll tell you why in a second, because there was another thing I wanted to say about the pre-germinating. One of the reasons to pre-germinate, well, there's a lot of reasons, but one of them is because you get a head start on um, getting them going and growing, because you've got optimum temperature and moisture in your, in your little paper towel inside your Ziploc bag on top of a heating mat or on top of your fridge where it's warm, something like that. And so you get a jump start on it. Um, other reasons too, if my seeds are old, I'm going to pre-germinate them because I don't wanna go with, to all the trouble to seed start dead seeds. So I want to see them germinate and then I can just cull out the ones that are bad. You do have to remember though that germination does not mean that it has endurance in the plant to viability to take it all the way to producing fruits and vegetables. Okay, so with a three inch net cup, I've got the moistened potting mix in here. That's the way, this is the way that it needs to be when it needs water. Um, and I'll put about two and a half, three tablespoons on top and that's the way that is good. Okay, this five and a half or whatever, five inch, six inch neck cup, I need to about double that. So I'm gonna say six tablespoons and six tablespoons is 3.75 ounces. Four ounces is a half a cup, so we're not quite at a half a cup. So here's a half a cup. This is, again, lukewarm water. Now I am not going to fill my little half cup measure up for each one of these pots. I'm just gonna give it some water. And 
And another reason you want to go ahead and put this water on here like this is to settle that potting mix down a little bit. Okay, with borage, it needs darkness to germinate. It needs to be uh, planted anywhere from like an eighth to a quarter-ish um, depth in your mix. You can use whatever. I didn't really bring anything out here. I guess I could use this pen and just create a little hole. Now, normally, <clears throat> Normally, I put two seeds per pot, and then just to make sure that one's going to come up. And with fussy seeds, if they both come up, you just take a sharp pair of scissors and cut one of them out. But, like I said, these are new seeds. And I'm not really worried. <laughs> I think they're all gonna germinate. In fact, my one floater went to the bottom. So I'm gonna bring it in closer and I'll show you how I empty this out so I don't lose any seeds. I can be a klutz sometimes. So I'm gonna pour a little bit of this water off And then I'm going to dump my seeds on the paper towel. So I have them all. And now we're just going to plop one each. And gently push it together and cover it up. As I said, these do not need light to germinate. In fact, oh, that one didn't get down there. There it is. <clears throat> they need to be dark, which is why they need to be under the soil. Some things need light to germinate, like lettuce needs light to germinate. So you sprinkle lettuce seeds pretty much just on the top. Very, very little potting mix on the top of the seeds because it has to have light. The next thing I do is I have this nice little water bottle. Um, I actually got it at a beauty supply place. I can't remember what, what it's called, but I like the way it sprays because it never not sprays. So I'm just going to go over and mist again with lukewarm water. Right where I planted a seed. Next step, cinnamon. I always use cinnamon on my seed starts. Going, what? Why? <laughs> Because cinnamon helps to prevent damping off of your seeds. I don't put it on more than once. Just do it at the beginning. Now, most of the time, you're going to want to put your seeds on a heat mat. But you kind of need to know... Um, what temperature seeds like to germinate at. And again, if you go to my blog article, I have another chart that gives you an idea of uh, exactly that, the temperature for germination. Peppers, tomatoes, eggplants, basil, all those things need pretty good high heat to germinate. Borage, however, will germinate 
in cooler temperatures, 65 to 70 degrees. So I'm not gonna be putting this on a heat mat. I'll put it in my house, in my office on a table, no lights, as soon as they germinate, which can take anywhere from five days, if it's a little bit warmer in that room, all the way up to two weeks, then I'll put it under lights. Also, I'm going to put some plastic wrap. I do not have a big plastic cover for this tray. So, I'm just using some cling wrap. Oop. Told you I'm klutzy. Come on. And this kind of creates a little microclimate, which will keep the moisture, some of the moisture in. But I will need to check it. Um, usually every day I'll check it, but, and just feel the weight of the cup. But normally, seriously, Normally, uh, they don't typically need any water for at least a couple of days. Now, if you got it under lights, that's gonna dry it out faster, but still, when you have it covered in plastic, like I said, that creates that little microclimate and it keeps moisture in. One thing I forgot to do is label it. Of course, I know this is borage, but I will go ahead and make me a tag. <laughs> I used to buy tags, but hey, that gets, that gets expensive, especially if you're putting a tag in every single cup, which normally I do because I end up moving them around and sometimes the whole tray is not the same thing. So now I make my own tags. I have a bunch of these plastic sample boards from when I was doing my faux finishing. And um, I just cut them up. This little marker, I've talked about it before. Garden marker. Um, I got it from Southern exposure.com southern seed exchange that's where i get it i'm trying to think now there's my, my friend penny penny if you're watching this you're gonna go ah i can't remember the name of the of the marker that she uses that doesn't bleed uh, but regular permanent markers bleed so this is the only thing i have found that does not bleed when it gets wet and yes, I do it outside and then take it inside. And since it's a little bit windy, I'm gonna run and take it inside before I lose my saran wrap. And then I'll come back because there were a couple of books I wanted to show you. Be right back. If you're like me, you like, you like books. Um, I also like to have several because I like to compare what they say in them. This is a really nice book. It's actually the Old Farmer's Almanac, Vegetable Gardener's Handbook. And I have it open here to the borage information. But uh, it gives nice pictures for each of the plants as well. Tells you how to seed start them. And usually some just extra information about that. Uh, this one is an excellent book. The New Seed Starters Handbook. It is by Nancy B-U-B-E-L, Bubel. And again, I was reading about the borage here. Borago officin officinalis is the technical name. And again, here it says days to germinate, five days at 70 uh, degrees Fahrenheit. 
when to plant, sow seeds directly in the garden a week or so before the last frost. There's not much advantage in growing transplants because borage doesn't like to be moved. For a steady harvest of the decorative and edible flowers and the edible leaves, so small batches of seeds every four weeks. I would not, unless you have a lot of ground in containers, I don't re-sow the borage. I cut it down and it comes back up. One plant, it just comes back up and flowers again. Um, the reason I plant the fussy plants in the bigger sized net cups is first off to give the roots way more room to grow and secondly when i am going to transplant it i can very carefully take it out of the net cup and not disturb the roots and get it right into my container and that's how i do it with the fussy seeds another book i love uh, is by ira wallace now this is for the southeast so if you're not in this region, it might not be of a benefit to you, but this is vegetable gardening in the Southeast. Ira Wallace, I believe was the main lady that was responsible for starting the Southern Seed Exchange. And that's another place that I really trust uh, getting my seeds from. In fact, I, I order my potatoes every year from them, seed potatoes. But excellent, excellent book. So if you live in the Southeast, I highly recommend this book. And then if you are a person that wants to learn a little bit more about medicinal herbs, medicinal, medicinal plants and how to grow them, how to use them, this is an excellent book by Christopher Hobbs and Leslie Gardner, Grow It, Heal It. I haven't really cracked this book open very much yet, um, maybe I'll get to it one year. <laughs> so that's borage. That's number one. Next up is going to be the hot peppers. I don't know if you know this, but hot peppers take longer to germinate than your sweet peppers. And I'll be showing you the different types and we'll get going on the peppers next. As always, thanks for watching. If you like this channel, please subscribe and hit that bell so you'll get notifications every time a video comes up. And remember, keep looking up. Bye and have a good one.